morning and welcome. Good morning. Is this microphone working? Yes, it is. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, it looks like all of you found your way to where you need to be. I'm still finding my way around the room. But I think we're going to be good. Uh, and it's lovely to see all of you this morning. We have a special day today. Uh, Jennifer Phelps is here this morning to do to do holy conversations after the service. Yep. yep. Holy number conversations three. number three. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. And uh, I'm glad that you all made it here safely. I'm still getting used to living at zero degrees or five degrees. <laughs> I grew up in Wisconsin where I tell people I froze my thermostat inside me and I've never been the same. And so I'm either hot or cold, but never quite right. <laughs> yes. Our opening hymn this morning is hymn number 381. The music, Christy, sounds wonderful so far. Thank you so much for being here. And welcome to all of you.
Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Please turn to page three. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord.
Put no trust in extortion. In robbery, take no empty pride. But wealth and grace set not your heart on it. God has spoken once, twice, and I have heard it. But that power belongs to God. Steadfast love is yours, O oh Lord. For you to pay everyone according to his deeds. The second reading is a reading from 1 Corinthians. I mean, brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even those who are wise be as though they have none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. Hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. Do 
sat under the trees in the cool of the evening. Someone asked, how did you get here? Not, how did you manage to be on a mission trip to Honduras? <coughs> how did you get here as a disciple? People told stories long into the night. People told such stories. Someone had just wandered into a mission planning group out of curiosity, liked what he heard, and had been there ever since. Someone's wife had died after a brief illness. Life as he knew it was taken from him, and he had to start over. Another person had been put here while still a kid by committed Christian parents, and he never left. Someone else had wandered away from the church of his youth, been around the block a few times, fought in a war, built a business, and still got drawn back to the church in middle age. At the end of the evening, one of the leaders said quietly, Jesus is amazing. His relentless, resourceful reach is amazing. Think about that question for yourself this morning. How did you get here? Today's lessons revolve around the theme of the call to service, the vocation of call that we each receive from God and that which is blessed in our baptism. In Mark's Gospel, we see Jesus' call to his first disciples with authority and the response of Jesus' followers to that call. Mark tells about simple fishermen who cast their nets in Galilee. One hymn says that they were quite happy to go on casting their nets until the Lord came down. In that moment when Jesus came to them and presented the invitation as a sort of royal command, they left their nets and followed. They abandoned the means of making their livelihood. James and John even abandoned their aging father, leaving him there in the boat with the hired hands. At this point, they couldn't have had any understanding of the vocation to which they were being called or what they were getting themselves into. They simply recognized a presence in Jesus, a manifestation of what God is, and that was enough. It's an amazing thing that Jesus started that day in calling his first four disciples. Listen to this brief account of Christ's early ministry as recorded by Justin Martyr in the middle of the second century. From Jerusalem, his followers, 12 in number, went out into the world. And although unlearned, without talent of speech, they have, through the power of God, made the whole human race to understand that they have been sent out by Christ. <clears throat> they were sent out by Christ to teach the word of God to all people, end quote. What an incredible thing that started here in Galilee. <clears throat> in the light of this exciting testimony, we might ask today, <clears throat> excuse me, what happened to the church? since those early days? Where is the intensity and the spirit of Jesus' followers? The showing forth of Jesus in the world on his third Sunday after the Epiphany comes to us from Mark in the call of Jesus' first disciples. <clears throat> the story itself is as brief as a bolt of lightning yet produces electrifying results. <clears throat> Excuse me. From the beginning, Jesus doesn't plan for a cozy little group. Jesus realizes the social dimension of the good news of God and the action that will be required. So he looks for persons who will be the backbone of his missionary movement. It's interesting to note that Jesus never tells these fishermen to believe or to follow this list of rules and regulations. He doesn't ask them as a group if they love him or if they will worship him or if they will lay down their lives for him. And they don't promise to do these things when he calls them. 
In the gospel, Jesus simply tells them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And they obey. No exceptional IQs here, or exemplary characters, or on religious learnings to qualify them to be Jesus' disciples. Only following Jesus does. What is not said in our gospel can be inferred. Jesus must have had something of a light or a fire that burned in him, that appeared to burn within him, for these two sets of fishermen brothers to leave everything behind and follow him. We can be sure that these four men had their detractors as well, the scoffers who let them know that following Jesus would prove that they were just as mad as he was, and yet to follow Jesus is what they decide to do. An English bishop of our Anglican communion once said, everywhere St. Paul went, there was a revolution. Everywhere I go, they serve tea. <laughs> Whatever happens to be life-changing and life-challenging meeting of the gospel with people's lives. <clears throat> One Christian writer points out that there were many phobias identified by psychologists, and maybe there should be a new phobia named among believers today that would be decisophobia, the fear of making an open and public decision for Christ. The institutional church seems a lot like some other would-be disciples mentioned in the Gospels, who could not leave their nets for this new life to which Jesus was calling them. There is a man with conflicting family obligations who asked Jesus if he could take care of some of those obligations first, and Jesus rebukes him, the man misses out on the call. There is the institutional church as the rich man who runs up and kneels at Jesus' feet with the fervor of someone asking for the winning lottery ticket. But when it comes to decision time, time to go sell what he has, and to give it to the poor and to follow, the man is sadly struck with decisophobia. He has too many comforts, or too many comforts have a hold of him. Think perhaps the real root of institutional decisophobia can be found in the misinterpretation of the call to us. <clears throat> we seem to hear a call <clears throat> as the invitation to boredom. We hear it as a grim life of endless pew-sitting, or maybe a never-ending succession of committee meetings. That's not the life call or vocation that Jesus has in mind. A different kind of perspective on the call of Jesus is suggested by William Barnwell, an Episcopal priest and author. This goes for the original four disciples and for us too. Barnwell was struck not by the disciples' sense of sacrifice, but by their reckless abandon. It's the same recklessness that characterizes the shepherd who leaves the 99 to go and find the one lost sheep. It's the same reckless dis recklessness displayed at the home of Simon when a woman with an alabaster jar full of expensive oil pours it over Jesus' head despite the protests of others. The decision to follow Jesus is anything but a cold bowl of cereal. It's a glorious break with convention, with decorum. It is a call to not hold back, but to overdo. It's a summons to absolute trust in the reliability and the abundance and the generosity of God. I wonder what calling you and I are being summoned to today by Jesus. I'm convinced that if each of us were to let go, to not hold back, but to respond to the generosity of God, to overdo, to even be a little reckless in answering the call, I'm convinced that every one of the opportunities and challenges and needs that we will hear about today and in our annual meeting next week will be met and supported and surpassed. 
I believe that we as a parish family would be able to reach our stewardship goals and then to reach for our dreams and achieve them. I believe that all of our ministries would be supported and those in need in whatever their need might be would be cared for and loved and served, whether locally or through the whole Episcopal Church or around the world in the Anglican Communion. How did you get here? How did I get here as a disciple? We are in church today because God called us, invited us, summoned us here. We are here not because we searched for God, but rather because God searched for us first and found us and gave us jobs to do in the kingdom. May God give us as much faith in ourselves as God has in us. May Christ bless us and give us what we need to do the work. And once more in all of these things, Jesus issues the invitation to everyone. Follow me. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Please stand as you are able. We affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally God of the Father, God from God, light from light. True God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things are made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified and conscious Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. Would the Father and the Son be his worshipped and glorified? He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Prayers of people can be found on page six in the church's book. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Pray, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth. Live together in your love and reveal your glory in the world. For Michael, our presiding bishop, Jennifer, our bishop, and Father Bob, our priest. For our companion diocese, born in Sedan, and their bishop, Bishop Ruben, and Brasilia, and their bishop, Mauricio. For the people of Haiti and their bishop, Sase. For the church of South India, United, and our Anglican Cycle Prayer. For our diocese and partner, St. Luke's, Candleton, Miss Lucy Gauntlet, Senior Warden. All the baptized and all bases, priests, and deacons. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Guide the people of this land and all nations in ways of justice and peace that they may honor one another.
and serve the common good. For Joe, our president, Eric, our governor, Thomas, our mayor, Lord in your mercy. Give us a reverence for the earth and your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to, uh, and to your honor and glory. For the homeless, unemployed, or underemployed, Lord in your mercy. Bless all those whose lives are closely linked with ours, and grant that they, we may serve them in Christ, in them, and love one another as he loves us. We pray for those in our daily prayer list, Larry Kirsten, uh, David, and Mary Cloud. We pray for those who celebrate birthdays or anniversaries this week, especially for Father Bob, who celebrated the 30, 37th anniversary of his ordination on January 17th. Lord, in your mercy, comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope for their in their troubles, and bring them the joy of your salvation. Especially, we pray for those hospitalized or needing prayer. We pray for Debbie Webb, Laura Holmsider Elridge, and for Marla. So I'm going to tell you a story about it. I was working in a hospital Wednesday, and this woman I've seen a couple of times, I recognized her face, and she said, I know you're a purple man. My name is Marlon, and I've been to your church a few times, and I know it's a purple church. So I'm asking you, you and your church to pray for me. So that's a testament to this church. For those in convalescent centers or at home, Bill Isley, Susan Bruno, Bonnie Conover, Sandra Hurley, Kenny McPherson, Mike Cannon, Ken Winchell Sherman, and Irene Alligator. For those who work to protect us, including the police, firefighters, and emergency personnel of our communities. For our men and women in armed forces, Brian Casper, Ethan Loach, Aubrey Gillen Cole, Reed Rascal, Travis Reed, Anita Rodriguez, Zach Webb, Allison Woodrow, Lord in your mercy. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that you that your will for them may be fulfilled, and we pray that we may share with your saints in your eternal kingdom. Especially, and this morning I realize when I look at the day, for Kenneth Holzleiter, my father has been gone 40 years today. We give thanks for all the flowers given in loving memory of former bishops, including Right Reverend John Crane and Right Reverend Ted Jones, and in thanksgiving for former bishop, Reverend Right Reverend Kate Wayney. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I give to you, my own peace I be with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church. And give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly city, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please stand as you are able. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Peace. There we go. There we go.
<laughs> but it was down to like 56, so I decided to talk to Father Bob that we should move in here. And thank you to the Alder Guild and everybody who's like, your assigned duties for moving, getting us moved in here. Um, so, the technician from Jackson Systems up here, he, he tweaked our panel and everything, it went good. He tested all the stuff, and everything's put down at capacity. It's just that the sanctuary is so vast, and the stained glass windows and so forth is the oldest part of the church, and there's not radiant heat, which is actually, was in a way, wasted. We were paying for the radiant heat. It was the old world was put out. If you ever went to the water room, you knew how warm it was when you walked in there. <clears throat> that heat really up, radiated up into the sanctuary. These are so efficient, there's not any radiating heat. So we need about, I talked to McConnell, we need about something to do 10% more. And there's a couple solutions. One could be costly, and the other is probably the best. It's putting a heating unit in our new, in the air handler. So like it has a cooling unit there anyway, and putting a heating unit in there that will circulate heated air. So that's what we're going to look like. Uh, so McConnell's going to get up here and take some measurements and so forth. And he can do that because he's uh, that air conditioner is a train and he's, he's a train certified also. So I think we'll be good. Anything else? Anybody else there have uh, announcements? So I came up here uh, to the church last night after being to a conference all day yesterday, and my lovely wife was here also getting ready for the home conversation. So uh, we, we got my foot to Christmas tree. <laughs> <laughs> Any other announcements from the departments? Ascribe to the Lord the honor to his name, bring offerings, and come into his courts.
now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And that he is not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever.
the post communion prayer on page 15 in your notes. <coughs> Let us pray. The eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in this sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace, and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. May Christ, the Son of God, be manifest in you, that your lives may be a light to the world. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Alleluia, alleluia.